Hello everyone, well my members anyway in the podcast. We're carrying on with Joan of Arc, don't worry if you can hear noise in the background, it's just my dogs munching their biscuits, that's all. Joan puts heart in her army, that's what we're on. <clears throat> Let's start. We were at the blow three days. Oh that camp, it is one of the treasures of my memory. Order. There was no more order among those brigands than there is among the wolves and the hyenas. They went roaring and drinking about, whooping, shouting, swearing, and entertaining themselves, all manner of rude and righteous horseplay. And the place was full of loud and lewd women, and they were no wit behind the men for romps and noise and fantastics. It was in the midst of this wild mob that Noel and I had our first glimpse of Lahir. He answered to our dearest dreams. He was of great size and of martial bearing. He was cased in mail from head to heel, with a bushel of swishing plumes on his helmet, and at his side the vast sword of the time. He was on his way to pay his respects in state to Joan, and as he passed through the camp he was restoring order and proclaiming that the maid had come and he would have no such spectacle as this exposed to the head of the army. His way of creating order was his own, not borrowed. He did it with great fists, and he moved along, swearing and admonishing. He let them think they they were driving it. It was their way and the other's way. It wasn't. It was actually his way. But they just thought it were their way. Damn you, he said, staggering, cursing around like this. And the commander-in-chief in the camp, straighten up. He laid the man flat out, actually. What his idea of straightening up was, was his own secret. We followed the veteran to headquarters, listening, observing, admiring, yes, devouring, you may say, the pet hero of the boy's from our cradles up to the happy day. I called to mind how Joan had once rebuked the paladin there in the pastures of Dolmenemi for uttering lightly those mighty names, Elahir, the bastard of Orleans, and how she said that if she could but be permitted to stand afar off and let her eyes rest once upon those great men, she would hold it a privilege. They were to her and the other girls just what they were to the boys. Well, here was one of them at last. And what was his errand? It was hard to realise it. And yet it was true. He was coming to uncover his head before her and take his orders. While he was quieting a considerable group of his brigands in his soothing way near headquarters, we stepped on ahead and got a glimpse of Joan's military family the great chiefs of the army, for they had all arrived now. There they were, six officers of wide renown, handsome men in beautiful armour. But the Lord High Admiral of France was the handsomest of them all and had the most gallant bearing. When the higher entered, one could see the surprise on his face at Joan's beauty and extreme youth. One could see, too, by Joan's glad smile, that it made her happy to get the sight of this hero of a childhood at last. And Lahaya bowed low with his helmet in his gauntleted hand and made a bluff. But handsome little speech with hardly an oath in it, and one could see that those two took to each other on the very spot. The visit of ceremony was soon over, and the others went away, but Lahaya stopped. And he and Joan sat there, and he sipped her wine and they talked and laughed together like old friends. Presently, she gave him some instructions in his quality as master of the camp, which made his breath stand still. For to begin with, she said that all these loose women must pack out of the place at once. She wouldn't allow one of them to remain. Next, the rough carousing must stop. Drinking must be brought within proper and strictly defined limits. 
and discipline must take the place of order. Finally, she climaxed the list of surprises with this, which nearly lifted him out of his armour. Every man who joins my standard must confess before the priest and absolve himself from sin, and all except the recruits must be present at divine service twice a day. La Hale could not say a word for a good part of a minute. Then he said in deep dejection, Oh, sweet child, they were littered in hell, those poor darlings of mine. Attend mass. Why, dear heart, they'll see us both damned first. And he went on, pouring out the most pathetic stream of arguments and blasphemy, which broke Joan all up and made her laugh, as she has not laughed since she played in the dominary pastures. It was good to hear. But she stuck to her point. So the soldier yielded and said, All right, if such were the orders, he must obey, and would do the best that was in him. Then he refreshed himself with a lurid explosion of oaths, and said that if any man in the camp refused to renounce sin and lead a pious life, he would knock his head off. That started John off again. She was really having a good time, you see. But she would not consent to that form of conversions. She said they must be voluntary. Lahir said that that was all right. He wasn't going to kill the voluntary ones, only the others that did not volunteer. No matter, none of them must be killed. Joan couldn't have it. She said that to give a man a chance to volunteer, on pain of death if he didn't, let him more or less trammelled. And she wanted him to be entirely free. And what she meant by that was, well, if you're going to torture a man or threaten a man, he's going to do it and not of his free will. And that isn't the right way. So the soldier sighed and said he would advertise the mass, but said he doubted if there was a man in the camp that was any more likely to go to it than he himself. Then there was just a surprise for him, for Joan said, But dear man, you are going. I, impossible. This is lunacy. Oh, no, it isn't. You're going to the service twice a day. Oh, I'm a dreaming. I'm a drunk. Or is my hearing playing me false? Why, I would rather go, never mind where, in the morning you're going to begin. <clears throat> and after that, it will come easy. I don't look downhearted like that. Soon you won't mind it. Lahir tried to cheer up, but he was not able to. He sighed like a zephyr and presently said, Well, I'll do it for you, but before I would do it for another, I swear I, but don't swear. Break it off. Break it off. It is impossible. I beg you to, to, why? Oh, my general, it is my native speech. He begged so hard for grace for his impediment that Joan left him one fragment of it. She said he might swear by his baton, the symbol of his generalship. He promised that he would swear only by his baton, when in her presence, and would try to modify himself elsewhere, but doubted he could manage it. Now that it was so old and stubborn a habit, and such a solace and support to his declining years, that tough old lion went away from there, a good deal tamed and civilised, not to say softened and sweetened, for perhaps those expressions would hardly fit him. Noel and I believe that when he was away from Joan's influence, his older versions would come up so strong in him that he could not master them, and so wouldn't go to Mass. But we got up early in the morning to see. Satan was converted, you see. Well, the rest followed. Joan rode up and down the camp, and... Wherever that fair young form appeared in its shining armour, with that sweet face to grace the vision, <clears throat> and perfect it was, the rude hosts seemed to think they saw the god of war in person, descended out of the clouds, and first they wondered, then they worshipped. After that, she could do with them what she want. In three days it was a clean camp. It was orderly. Barbarians were herding to divine service twice a day, like good children. The women were gone. Lahai was stunned by these marvels. He could not understand them. He went outside the camp when he wanted to swear. 
He was a sort of man, sinful by nature and habit, but full of superstitious respect for holy places. The enthusiasm of the reformed army for Joan, its devotion to her, and the hot desire she had aroused in it to be led against the enemy exceeded any manifestations of this sort which La Haye had ever seen before in his long career. His admiration of it all, and his wonder over the mystery and miracle of it, were beyond his power to put into words. He had held this army cheap before, but his pride and confidence in it knew no limits now. He said, two or three days ago, it was me afraid of the hen roost. One could stand the gates of hell with it now. John and he were inseparable, and a quaint and pleasure contrast they made. He was so big, she was so little. He was so grey, and far along in his pilgrimage of life, she was so youth, youthful. His face was bronzed and, bronzed and scarred, hers fair and pink, so fresh and smooth. She was so gracious, and he was stern. She was pure, so innocent. He, such a cyclopedia of sin, in her eye was stored all clarity and compassion in his lightnings. When her glance fell upon you, it seemed to bring benediction and the peace of God. But with his, it was different, generally. They rode through the camp a dozen times a day, visiting every corner of it, observing, inspecting, perfecting, and wherever they appeared, the enthusias enthusiasm broke forth. They rode side by side. He a great figure of brawn and muscle, she a little masterwork of roundness and grace. He is a fortress of rusty irons. She is a shining statuette of soul. And when the reformed raiders and bandits caught sight of them, they spoke out with affection. And they welcomed in their voices and said, There they come, Satan and the page of Christ. All the three days that were in blow, Joan worked earnestly. And tirelessly, to bring him here to God, to rescue him from the bondage of sin, to breathe into his stormy heart the serenity and peace of religion. She urged, she begged, she implored, prayed. He stood out, he really did. The three days of uh, stay begging and piously to be let off, to be let off from just that one thing, that impossible thing, he would do anything else, anything, command. <clears throat> and... He would obey. He would go through the fire for her if she said the word. But spare him this, only this. For he couldn't pray. Had never prayed. He was ignorant of how to frame a prayer. He had no words to put in it. And yet, can any believe it? She carried even that point. She won that incredible victory. She made Lahir pray. It shows, I think, that nothing was impossible to Joan of Arc. Yes, he stood there before her and put up his mailed hands and made a prayer. But it wasn't borrowed, but was his very own. He had none to help him frame it. He made it out of his own head, saying, Fair Sir God, I pray you do by Lahaya as he would do by you if you were Lahaya and he were God. Then he put on his helmet and marched out of John's tent and satisfied with himself, as he was, as anyone might be who had arranged a perplexed and difficult business to the content and admiration of all the parties concerned in the matter. If I had know that he had been praying, I could have understood why he was feeling so superior, but of course I did not know that. I was coming to the tent at that moment and saw him come out, and saw him march away in that large fashion, and indeed it was a Fine and beautiful thing to see. But when I got to the tent door, I stopped and stepped back, grieved and shocked, for I heard Joan crying, as I mistakenly thought, crying as if she could not contain, nor endure the anguish of her soul, crying as if she would die. But it was not so. She was laughing. She was laughing at Lahaya's prayer, but she waited till it went. It was not until six and thirty years afterward that I found that out. And then, oh, then I only cried when the picture of the young carefree mirth rose before me out of the blur and mist of that long vanished time. For there had come a day, 
between when God's good gift of laughter had gone out from me to come again to more in this life. <clears throat> now there is a statement that says this prayer has been stolen many times and by many nations in the past 460 years, but it originated with Lahir. And the fact is, it's an official record in the National Archives of France. There is authority of it on Michel, Michelet, for the translation. So we actually had to get authority from a particular person to be able to put that prayer in this book because it's stated in the official, ar um, yeah, the official artifacts of France. That's how important it actually became. Well, that's very interesting indeed. Um, yeah, I can imagine it now, actually, to be fair. I'd probably be laughing too. But, you know, he walked away thinking he was great for what he said and she's just sat there laughing her head off because, you know, I mean, it's not exactly one of those prayers, is it, that you would imagine someone saying they're about to go to war, could die, and that was prayer. So I understand, I understand why she laughed. Um, so, yeah, that's the next part of Joan of Arc, an interesting part. I mean, I wonder how she did it all, really, when you think about it. There's so much that she did. It's unbelievable. Thank you for listening and many blessings.